Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Center for the Study of World Religions. Many of you are familiar faces and have been here many times, but if this is your first time here, a special welcome to the Center. So, and many of you I know, but if I don't know you, my name is Frank Clooney. I'm the director of the Center and happy to be your host tonight. And again, anyone who's coming in, there are still chairs on this side of the room, so don't be shy about coming over here. So we're very happy tonight to have the second uh, in our series of the Hindu, Hindu View of Life annual lecture. And this is a new venture, and it's an exciting new possibility for the center and for thinking through issues from a Hindu perspective here at Harvard University. We call it the Hindu View of Life lecture, uh, partly to echo the memory of Dr. S. Radhakrishnan's famous little book, Hindu Way of Life, which came out first in the 1920s based on a lecture series he gave and is still in print some now 90 years later. And what was interesting about it in, in the beginning was simply that it was a, a constructive understanding of the world from an authentic, deeply considered Hindu perspective, containing lectures within it on religious experience, the conflict of religions, and two lectures on Hindu dharma. As Dr. Radhakrishnan puts it in the uh, lecture itself, it aims to address constructively and for our era 1920s, but you might say now, urgent issues of our time from a perspective informed by insights and values arising from the Hindu traditions of India, and now we would add Hinduism globally. Another reason for echoing Dr. Radhakrishnan's famous book, Hindu View of Life, in our lecture series is that we were happy, uh, long before my time, to have Dr. Radhakrishnan as the first day speaker when the center opened in 1960. So he had already spent uh, years at Oxford in this the very distinguished Spalding professorship there and had contacts here, it seems, at Harvard and came over and was the speaker for the first day. We have very few photographs from that day, but we do have an audio uh, recording of his lecture from that first day and a printed copy and so on. And in the back above the refreshments is a Shiva Nataraj, which if you look closely has the name S. Radhakrishnan on the bottom. And I think, I have no evidence, but that it was given by him as a gift on that first day. So we're in that tradition that goes back to the beginning of the center and long before it. Today I would say that the underlying this lecture is a confidence that these great traditions, including today the Hindu traditions of India, still have much to offer the wider human community today. Resources from ancient times, medieval times, modern times, that are made evident in expert presentations, exchanges among scholars alert to the needs of today. Uh, here at the center, we don't believe that old ideas are outmoded ideas, but rather that they live new lives in generation after generation. As is fitting to the, the center, which gratefully received this gift, the lecture includes attention to the Hindu view of pluralism, the religious traditions of the world, and any topic really that the uh, speaker chooses to take up on the occasion. I'm very happy here to have uh, with us today uh, Mr. Akhilesh Gupta, who has made this uh, lectureship possible with his generous gift to the center. He came here several years back in the Advanced Leadership Initiative to Harvard and never left, and he's still here. Um, he uh, took a course of mine on the Bhagavad Gita and added so much to the course and then has been coming and going ever since. So we're very grateful to Akhilesh for being here. Mr. Gupta holds a, M -tech, a B Tech degree in chemical engineering with distinction from IIT in Delhi and an MBA degree from Stanford University. He was the senior managing editor and chairman of Blackstone India. And in, when we were discussing the gift and we wrote some things down, Mr. Gupta uh, notes that the values of the Hindu view of life is not simply because of the ancient origins of this wisdom, but because of the universal message it contains for all times and for all people. The lessons of Hinduism's core tenets are as relevant for the modern world as they are, were in ancient times, appealing to, quote, to a wide cross-section of people from the very scientifically oriented to those with a devotional bent of mind. Mr. Gupta adds, in the spirit is my privilege to support the efforts of the center in promoting interfaith dialogue and the opportunities for traditions to be learning from one another. So we thank you very much and glad you could be here with us tonight. The first lecture in this series, uh, some of you were at, I think, was back in April. Uh, Vasudha Narayan, professor at University of Florida, gave the first lecture then, 
And we think of 2016 as the first year, so we have two first lectures in our series. And we're very delighted tonight to have Dr. Uh, Professor Arvind Sharma, the Burke's Professor of Comparative Religion at McGill University in Montreal, to be our speaker. Before I say anything more about him formally, we're also delighted uh, to have him as an alumnus of the center, uh, one of our many distinguished visitors who lived at the center, I think in the early 70s, you said. And we're delighted to have, particularly in this bicentennial year of the Harvard Divinity School, to have people who lived here and studied here over the generations to come back and be with us again. Two weeks from today, we have Guy Strumsa, professor at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who lived here, I think, at the same time in the early 70s. He'll be giving the annual uh, list lecture in Jewish studies. So we like to keep the connections between then and now with return of our most distinguished residents. So let me just say a few things about uh, Professor Sharma. If I said everything about him, I would take all the time and we'd have to quit with my remarks. But just to say a few words, uh, Professor Sharma uh, was born in India in Varanasi, did his early education at the Modern School in New Delhi. He attained his bachelor's degree in Allahabad University. And interestingly, and I only learned this recently, uh, then joined the Indian Administrative Service, the IAS, in 1962 and served in the state of Gujarat for six years until 1968. He was posted as a district development officer in Ahmedabad, where he also served early on as the managing director of the Gujarat Industrial Development Corporation. So who says scholars don't have their feet in the real world? Um, but then he came to America. Uh, he resumed his academic career in 1968 when he came to Syracuse University in upstate New York. He obtained a master's in economics uh, more dealing with the real world in 1971 from Syracuse University with a master's dissertation on Hindu scriptural value system and India's economic development, a timely topic. His thesis signaled a shift in his academic interest toward religion, and so he came here to Harvard Divinity School getting his MTS degree in 1974. I'm happy to see a number of MTS students in the audience <coughs> here today. And then stayed on to join the Sanskrit Department of Sanskrit and Indian Studies here at Harvard, getting his PhD in 1978. His doctoral work focused on Abhinava Gupta's commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. He eventually uh, translated it fully and then published it a few years later. Uh, after that, and I won't go through all the details, he um, taught in Australia for almost 10 years in Queensland University in Brisbane, and then came to Canada in 18, 1987 so 20 years, 30 years now, in, at McGill University, where, as I said, he is the Burke's Professor of Comparative Religion. And in that context, he has done many things, uh, most strikingly, a series of global congresses in the world religions after 9-11, aiming to seek out harmony and to find peace among the religions. Um, and I think most the last of the conferences was just a few weeks ago. And there's a beautiful statement of harmony among the religions that I'm sure he can tell you about if you have any uh, questions we could talk about later. And then finally, um, not to take any more of your precious time in being here, uh, just to say he is an author, I was counting in his CV maybe 40 monographs, 40 books, not counting the 20 or so that he has edited. And then the articles were too innumerable to count, so I gave up trying to count those. <laughs> but a great range of topics. So early on, the Gitarta Sangraha of Abhinavda Gupta, the commentary on the Gita, was one of the first books, perhaps, in 1982, although before that, Vishishtadvaita Vedanta, a study, 1978. A well-respected and well-appreciated book in uh, 1986, marking a 200th anniversary of the translation of the Gita into English, the Hindu Gita, its ancient and classic interpretations, and a book that I knew when I was starting my teaching over at Boston College years ago, Women in World's Religions, in 1987. He was the editor of that. 1996, Hinduism for Our Times, 2003, Hinduism and its Sense of History. And for me, as a person in comparative studies, the very interesting 2005 book, Religious Studies and Comparative Metholo Methodology, A Case for Reciprocal Illumination, where the traditions don't compete or contest with each other, but illuminate each other back and forth. It's a beautiful image and very well, well worked out in the book. Uh, more recently, a more uh, autobiographical book in 2011, uh, one Religion, Too Many, 
the religiously comparative reflections of a comparatively religious Hindu. Um, <laughs> clever title and a wonderful book. Uh, 2011, Hinduism as a Missionary Religion. Uh, 2012, a source book of classical Hindu thought. 2013, Gandhi, a spiritual biography. And a new book, I think, that's just out last year, Decolonizing Hindu Studies. So a wonderfully productive scholar. You can ask him questions about how he manages to do all of this <laughs> when he speaks. But he had asked me uh, months ago when I invited him, was it OK to take up a somewhat controversial topic? And I said, sure, why not? That's why we're here. Dharma and the Academy, question mark. A Hindu academic's view of the recent tensions between the academic and faith communities. So let us welcome Professor Sharma. Uh, thank you, Frank. I guess all that I have to do now is to justify all that you have said <laughs> <laughs> about me. Uh, it's nice to be back at the center. Uh, I'll address the topic directly. The relation between the academic community and the Hindu community, or rather the relations between them, have recently been characterized by a sharp debate. This is also spilled over into journalism and on the internet. This development has been prompted by the reservations expressed by a significant number of Hindus, both in North America and India, over the way Hinduism is portrayed in the Western academia, and by the vigorous response of the academic community to such criticism. Now, as an academic who is also a Hindu, and as a Hindu who is also an academic, I stand at the volatile point of intersection between these two communities. And this makes my role particularly fraught. It seems to me that the issue first needs to be viewed on the broadest canvas possible, namely, that of the history of ideas. Such a historical perspective is best developed, in my view, by utilizing the distinction regularly drawn in the study of religion between the insider and the outsider. Notwithstanding some problems of definition involved in invoking this distinction. From the point of view of this distinction, the study of religion seems to exhibit a fourfold typology in terms of the modalities of transmission involved of the tradition, in the context of how the study of the various religions has proceeded over the past few centuries, and the transmission of knowledge of the tradition. First, from insider to insider. Second, from outsider to outsider. Third, from outsider to insider. And fourth, from insider to outsider. The various religions flourished in relative isolation in the pre-modern era. Historians do warn us that perceptions of such isolation may be somewhat exaggerated. But no one has seriously challenged the view that the main channel of communication involving the various religious traditions during this phase was from insider to insider. This state of affairs began to change with the rise of the West and the onset of the modern era. During this phase, as the West became familiar with the religions of the Americas, Africa, and Asia, one main mode of transmission about these religions became from outsider to outsider. Western scholars, outsiders to these various religious traditions, 
began sharing their knowledge about these religions with other Westerners who were as much outsiders to the religious traditions they were receiving information about as those providing it. So this is the second phase. Then the West, however, began to control the intellectual discourse in its colonies as the Western domination of the world became institutionalized in the form of colonialism and imperialism. And the insiders of the traditions began to be profoundly affected even in their self-understanding of their own religious traditions by Western accounts. Thus another dimension was added to the manner in which religious communication was now taking place, outsider to insider. This age of European imperialism had run its course by the end of the Second World War. And the direction of the discourse took yet another turn after the liberation of the former colonies. The members of the various non-Western religious traditions began to challenge their colonial, colonial descriptions in the post-colonial world. Now the insiders themselves began to claim the right to tell the outsiders about their faith, thus reversing the flow of information from outsider to insider to insider, to outsider. The present tensions arguably reflect the state of discourse about Hinduism at this cusp of uh, insider to outsider. If the perspective presented here possesses any merit, then we now stand at a turning point in the relationship among the interlocutors in the study of religion. Historical changes, however, are not linear, even when the direction is discernible, or are rarely linear, even when the direction is discernible. Historical changes are more like changes in ocean flows caused by tides. It is sometimes not apparent immediately that the tide has begun to turn, even when it has. And even as the tide advances, there are backflows, which tend to confuse the onlooker or the picture. Such a tidal shift also generates eddies and undercurrents. The going is not always as smooth as at high tide when the scene takes on a serene aspect and the ocean seems to bear its bosom to the moon, as Wordsworth would like to say. This metaphor, if not off the mark, may serve both to illustrate and explain the messiness of the present situation. However, although it might make it more understandable, it does not make it easier to deal with. For many issues demand, for many issues demand our attention at the same time. One is thus forced to be selective, and one hopes without being arbitrary. I would like to identify, if so originally five, but now it has become seven. <laughs> so I would like to identify seven such issues that is stare at us in the face. I hope these issues will resonate with the audience, independently of whether they belong to the academic community or the Hindu community. I shall employ a rubric to encapsulate the key point on each of the five, now seven issues, I wish to foreground, in the hope that the expression being employed to describe them will become increasingly clear as we proceed. Now, the seven encapsulating expressions are the response threshold, cognitive versus non-cognitive approaches to religion, 
bias and error, the genetic fallacy, the observer effect, the dis distinction between an academic and a polemical book, and finally, the idea of the Purupaksh and its relevance. The response threshold, take <coughs> up the first one. So now we are going to have a brief description of each of these. Yeah. The response threshold. We owe this expression to Professor Eric J. Sharp. In fact, when he mentioned it to me first at Sydney, I asked him whether I could steal it. It seems so appropriate, apropos, sorry. He writes, a response threshold is crossed when it becomes possible for the believer to advance his, his or her own interpretation against that of the scholar. In classical comparative religion, this was hardly a problem since most of the scholar's time was spent investigating the religions of the past and often of the very remote past. Interpretations might be challenged, but only by other specialists. Only by other specialists working according to Western canons and conventions. Today, by contrast, a greater proportion of study is devoted to contemporary, or at least recent forms of living traditions. The study of religion often shades into a dialogue of religions in which the views of both partners are, at least in theory, equally important. The, resp the response threshold implies the right of the present day devotee to advance a distinctive interpretation of his or her own tradition, often at variance with that of Western scholarship, and to be taken entirely seriously in doing so." End of quote. What one is thus experiencing now in the academic world is the crossing of the response threshold by the Hindu community in North America and India. This community in North America has reached the critical demographic mass when its reactions can no longer be disregarded. It is also displaying a new assertiveness in India. As teachers of religion, we have perhaps already had our own experience of the resp response threshold being crossed by our students uh, in the class when we have fielded questions from those who belong to the very faith about which we have been teaching them. This raises the question, how should members of the academic community react when members of the faith community, not just members of the student community or colleagues in the academic community, but members of the faith community cross the response threshold. The other two we are used, you know, the students asking us and our colleagues taking us to task, but uh, uh, the members of the Hindu community crossing the response threshold. The answer to this question is now in the process of being formulated before our very eyes. So this was the first point I wanted to make, this connection. The second one is cognitive versus non-cognitive approach. It is clear from the documentation about this debate, which is available to many of us, that the protest is not always about facts, which may be adjudicated on the basis of evidence, but often about interpretations which do not seem susceptible to such verification. The main achievements of modern science proceeded from the falsifiability of its hypotheses. But such does not seem 
fully applicable to the case here. How do you falsify an interpretation? We thus need to distinguish clearly between cognitive and non-cognitive approaches to the study of religion. Now, how important is this distinction? I quote uh, Professor John Hick, when we assert that what we take to be a fact or deny what is alleged to be a fact, we are using language cognitively. The population of China is one billion. The book is dated, of course it is more now. This is a hot summer. Two plus two makes four. He is not here. Are cognitive utterances. Indeed, we can define a cognitive or informative or indicative sentence as one that is either true or false. Thus the statement that Sanskrit is the language in which many sacred texts of Hinduism were composed represents an example of the cognitive use of language. There are, however, other kinds of utterances which are neither true nor false because they fulfill a different function from that of endeavoring to describe facts. This sentence is again from Professor Hick. When it is proposed that Sanskrit is the language which contributes to social and political oppression, then this statement cannot be said to be true or false in the sense the statement about it being the language in which many Sanskrit texts of Hinduism, sorry, in which many sacred texts of Hinduism uh, were composed could be considered to be. When we ask whether a claim is cognitive or non-cognitive, then the query divides into two. Are such sentences intended by their users to be used cognitively? And two, is their logical character such that they can, in fact, regardless of the intention, be either true or false? Once the Western presentation of the tradition, which happens to be non-cognitive in nature, is attacked by followers of the tradition, the non-cognitive approach may be far more open to frisson than the cognitive approach when employed. One could perhaps appeal to the verdict of the academic community on the point just as one might determine the stance of a faith community. I'm not talking about the non-cognitive interpretation. One might appeal to the verdict of the academic community. Look, others also think that this is the right interpretation. Just as one might determine the stance of the faith community, that most Hindus or Christians believe this way. However, the fact that the approach is non-cognitive, which is to say non-falsifiable, either historically or phenomenologically, does seem to suggest that a new set of criteria might be required to assess it. This makes the study of religion less of a science to that extent and more of an art. It also complicates claims to academic freedom. For how is one to adju adjudicate the charge of the community that in a particular instance, an exercise in academic freedom has degenerated into an exercise in academic license? And that the exercise in academic license, in turn, has further degenerated into an exercise in academic licentiousness. <laughs> the current controversy thus enables us to identify a new challenge, how to adjudicate differences of opinion, sometimes sharp, 
between the academic and the faith communities with criteria ideally acceptable to both when the non-cognitive use of language is involved. Is involved. Okay. So this was the second point I'd like to make in this context. The third one is bias and error. Uh, it has been claimed in the debate that either the academics or the members of the faith tradition are either biased or in gross error when dealing with some aspects of Hinduism. In fact, you know, basically, Western scholars wonder whether Hindus can ever invoke their, with, talk about their tradition without sentimentality. And Hindus wonder whether Western scholars can ever talk about Hinduism without condescension. <laughs> However, fallibility is a human condition. No one is either infallible or capable of achieving Archimedean objectivity. Both common sense and humanity demand that some procedures be devised in our field for distinguishing between random human error and error caused by bias, conscious or unconscious. The task might appear insurmountable on the face of it, but there is good news. Statistics as a science is concerned with, and indeed has, evolved ways of distinguishing between random error and systemic error or bias through a process known as hypothesis testing. It is a pity that for all the popularity statistics enjoys, no one has been willing to give the scientific turn to the discussion of Orientalism in the Scythian sense. What one needs is a data bank of examples of alleged biases and errors pertaining to a work, an individual scholar, or a field in general. This will make it at least theoretically possible to identify both Orientalist as well as chauvinistic excesses in the current discourse by outsiders and insiders, respectively. The current situation thus enables us to identify a third new challenge, the need for creating a database for which the following acronym is proposed, asbestos. This is a conceit. Archives for the study of bias and error in the study and teaching of religions. So I take the S from the religions and make it asbestos. As applied to Hinduism, it should document instances of bias and error identified by concerned parties, both in the Western presentation of Hinduism as well as in the presentation of Hinduism by the Hindus. This will level the playing field and provide the basis for achieving greater academic objectivity, an aim worth pursuing, even if we think that this is an aim which can be only approached or can only be approached asymptotically. I can never really get there. So this was my, I think, the third. Yeah. Yeah. Come to the fourth point, the genetic fallacy. Members of both the Hindu and the academic community have expressed deep distress at the ad hominem nature of the attacks leveled on or by the members of the two communities. 
Now, the concept of genetic fallacy is one way of dealing with this. It provides us with the intellectual basis for dispensing with ad hominem attacks. Philosophers have long insisted that the falsity or validity of a proposition can only be determined, only be determined, by examining the proposition on its own merits, irrespective of the source. One philosopher offers the following telling if Holmes an illustration of the genetic fallacy. The theory of relativity, either special or general or both, is false because Einstein used to beat his wife or was not a good husband. Character assassination can kill the person, metaphorically speaking, not the proposition. This is not to say that a person's background has no bearing on the discussion. For after all, an expert's statement may not always be treated the same way as that of one who is not. But such background only affects the credibility of the proposition, not its truth. It's a very important point. After all, experts can also commit mistakes. Thus, both communities might wish to steer clear of this genetic fallacy in serious discussion. Okay, the next point I have is the observer effect. An observer effect is said to have occurred when the very act of observation alters the phenomenon being observed, as happens in some branches of physics. I am told now that I have an authority from my physicist friends that an electron, in order to be observed, must first interact with a photon which will invariably change its path. The very act of observation affects the observation. A closer to home example of this phenomenon is provided by the fact that in order to check the pressure of an automobile tire, some air has to be released, which changes the pressure. If we apply this principle to the study of religion, then it leads to the suggestion that students of religion may affect a religion in the very process of studying it. This principle provides a basis for examining the fear of the Hindus that Western scholars may be altering Hinduism in the very process of studying it and that the change that's brought about is not for the better. For instance, a pious follower of Veer Shaivism, or indeed even of other forms of Shaivism, might begin to feel that some Western scholars, by proposing repeatedly that the Shiv Linga is phallic in nature, may be importing this fallacy into Hinduism. Similarly, this principle also provides a basis for examining the fear of Western scholars that the Hindu community, by the very act of placing them under the lens of observation, may be compromising genuine scholarship. The fear of self-censorship. That would be the case if Western scholars started practicing self-censorship for fear of arousing the wrath of the Hindus. Uh, 
The last two points I have is uh, the sixth one is uh, the importance of the distinction between an academic book and a polemical book. I think we need to distinguish clearly between an academic book and a polemical book. An academic book aims at investigating an issue in a detached and even-handed manner and ideally presents as much evidence as possible <coughs> and as many perspectives as possible which can be brought to bear on an issue before offering a conclusion of its own. The aim of a polemical book is different. It is to provoke a discussion of the issue uh, rather than analyze the issue in this way. Now our criteria for judging a book will differ depending, depending on whether the book claims to be an academic book or a polemical book. An academic book will have to be judged on the basis of what could be called Praman and Siddhan. Uh, I am referring here to, or I have, in, I have in mind here the statement by Hemchandra, a well-known Jain polymath, at the end of one of his works when he says, when he really begs forgiveness from the readers for any errors which may remain in the book because of his dullness. And the phrase he uses is, Pramana Siddhanta Viruddha Matra Yatkinche Duktam Matimandya Doshat Masari Mutsari Tadare Chitta Prasadamadaya Vishodhayan. Now, Praman, the criterion of Praman or evidence addresses the issue of whether the relevant evidence has been presented or not. All of it should be presented. Praman. The criterion of Siddhant addresses the question of whether sound conclusions have been drawn on the basis of that evidence. That is, all opinions have been taken into account. The aim of a polemical book is to provoke discussion. It does not aim to engage in the controversy in a sober manner. It wants to start the discussion. It would be wise here to distinguish between two points. Whether, one, whether a book claims to be an academic book, and two, whether it deals with academic matters but sets out to be polemical rather than academic. So in the case of an academic book, we would like to apply the criterion of Hemchandra. But in the case of a book which deals with academic matters, but sets out to be polemical in nature, we'll have to probably relax that uh, criteria. Such a book still must achieve a certain level of competence to merit our engagement. But this bar will be lower in the context of a polemical book as compared to an academic book. The point is interesting because I've always been intrigued why academics never talk about freedom of expression when they claim their right to write what they write. They claim the right to academic freedom. I've always been intrigued why. The ordinary person who's responding to this, the academic, claims the right of freedom of expression. So there's a freedom of academic freedom and there's freedom of expression. And I think the logic of the distinction probably is that the academic wants to use the first criteria, the Praman and Siddhan. And the person from the tradition is uh, first a tradition under academic freedom because he's an academic. But the other person is not an academic. So the person is invoking his right or her right to freedom of expression. Now then I come to the final point. 
द पूर्व पक्ष ट्रेडिशन पीपल हेयर नो मच मोर अबाउट इट दैन आई डू सो आई विल रेफर टू दर जजमेंट बट द वर्ड इज यूजली यूज इन इंडियन इंटेलेक्चुअल डिस्कोर्स टू डिस्क्राइब द इनिशियल पोजिशन विच नीड्स टू बी रिफ्यूटेड before the main thesis can be established one begins with the objections that could be raised against the intellectual effort being undertaken and then proceeds to examine and hopefully answer these objections in order to create the intellectual room for the scholar to present his or her own thesis the seriousness and thoroughness with which the opponent's view point of view or view is presented in hinduism and i'm sure in other works as well in the indic mlu is quite striking actually sometimes when i would read though i would wonder how the guy is going to get out of this i mean he has built a, such an iron clad case for his enemy his opponent so now i think what is happening here is that when western scholarship about india started it was using the tradition or the traditional accounts as the poor paksh for itself that is the initial position to be before they start the and now what has happened is that the people who are challenging it are using that tradition itself as the poor paksh for their position so this gives a totally new dimension to this how the poor paksh operates so i'll just conclude now and look forward to your questions all i'll say by conclusion is that in my own view both the insider and the outsider outsider see the truth but if we accept uh, shankara's definition of true knowledge as that knowledge no part of which has ever to be discarded no part of which ever needs to be discarded and true knowledge arises i may suggest or may i suggest at the point of intersection between the two thank you so thank you professor sharma for a wonderful and exceedingly clear lecture raising so many points in such a relatively short time also thank you very much So Professor Sharma uh, decided to sit to take your question so he doesn't get knocked off his feet. <laughs> But the floor is now open and you can take them or I can help identify some people as well. So who would like to ask the first question? My name is Hasan Dayas and uh, my comment on uh, your very thoughtful uh, comment about the freedom of expression and academic and um, I may be wrong but what appears to me is that freedom of expression needs to be circumscribed by other constraints such as other people's sens- sensibility and therefore it must uh, be uh, it, it, it has certain bounds there is academic freedom being the pursuit of knowledge cannot be circumscribed by either sensibility or other factors and must be allowed unfettered uh, uh, scope to investigate. And that uh, seems to be the kind of understanding that I get from these two expressions. Uh, that was a very, very fine distinction. And thank you for that. Now the question that arises is that uh, the pursuit of truth about religions so what does that entail does that entail or at what point does it entail the transgression of the believer's point of view and that's where the debate rests uh, the i think the working kind of assumption we have in our field is that when we are writing in a context in which we have to represent the religion as it is understood by the believers then we bow to the judgment of the believers in our description but where we are dealing with matter which go beyond it when we are dealing with common types when we are dealing with psychological or sociological or other methods 
which are often considered reductive, at that point in our study, we transcend the self-understanding of the believers in the interest of a deeper insight. I think what the trouble arises is when the, in the kind of literature, popular literature, which is accessible to the ordinary person, to the lay person, when that attitude or those findings seep in and are received by that believer, then we have protests. I mean, issues arise because of multiplicity of interpretations at different levels and depths of understanding. And so uh, very often in the popular conception, what might be coming out of a different depth of understanding may be misunderstood as derogatory exactly. or uh, misrepresenting the popular conception of it. Very true. I think an example would be that if you are writing a piece on any religion for an encyclopedia, then we should present the religion in which the believers can recognize themselves. Yes, you know, <laughs> this is an account of Islam, I'm a Muslim and I accept this. Yeah. And when we are dealing with issues in our own academic, rarefied uh, atmosphere and our uh, conclaves, academic conclaves, <laughs> then we can feel more free yeah, in crossing the border. Yeah. As you know, Wilfred Campbell Smith made that point probably in this room many times. Mm -hmm. What you write should at least be recognizable to the people of the tradition you're writing about. Mm -hmm. You probably heard him talking about it here. Yeah, but he made a very interesting uh, uh, footnote to that. He said that everything that you say should be acceptable to the insider, but everything the insider says does not have to be accepted by you. <laughs> so it's not the, uh, the academic version of the customer is always right. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if labels matter, what can you say that academics believe that they have a right to academic expression, a right to academic expression, whereas we have a freedom of expression. One's a right and the other a freedom. And what if you inverted that? How would that change the debate? No, but they also claim the right to academic freedom. When they say that, you know, our academic freedom is being challenged, I think what they really mean is that our right to academic freedom is being challenged. Versus but probably your question is deeper, yeah. So one's a right and the other's a freedom. Oh, yeah, OK. Now, the question is then whose freedom? I mean, whose freedom? Or can there be a distinction drawn between a right and a freedom? And is one more powerful than the other? The expression of rights usually takes the form of freedom. Right? We have uh, freedom of religion. We have freedom of expression. We have freedom from arbitrary arrest. So rights and freedoms often go together. But I have a feeling that the distinction could be very significant. I cannot put my finger on it at the moment. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Please, uh, uh, here and then there. Next. <laughs> um, yes. So, so speaking to the distinction between cognitive and non-cognitive utterances, um, from what I understand, cognitive utterances are those which can be considered to be either true or false, whereas non-cognitive utterances are more interpretive. Is that correct? Yeah, there's an initial position, yeah. So you mentioned that um, it would be helpful to have some sort of criteria by which to adjudicate um, um, non-cognitive utterances. But absent a means to declare them true or false, how, how might we go about it? Okay. So we may have to change, not call them, not use the binary of true and false, but valid or invalid, or acceptable or unacceptable. Give you an example of the phallic uh, symbol of as Shiva. Now, you can have a survey of Hindus and find how many of them consider Shivalinga a phallic symbol. Right? That will be a phenomenological way of finding out whether a certain belief exists or not. And it can be verified or rejected. Now, of course, the problem arises that you might have historical texts or during a historical period when it was considered that, which has now lapsed from about which the tradition has an amnesia. 
So there when the situation starts getting complicated. Right. So and then you can explain the amnesia itself in terms of psychology. For instance, it has been suggested that when Hindus lost political power, that is when the phallic significance of the Shivalinga started receding because of the emasculation under foreign rule. I mean, the, how the psychology is. Uh, Professor Sharma, thank you so much for this. Um, I'm both a journalist and a student of religion. I'm having just a hard time understanding, and I, you know, want further explanation or just clarification. How do you classify who's an insider and who's an outsider, and who gets to decide that? Yeah. <laughs> and the problem is complicated by the fact that the insider and the outsider distinction also depends on the distinction between <coughs> two kinds of religions, uh, the Abrahamic and the Indic. Uh, this is a very important point, so may I take a few minutes to oh, please, uh, yes. develop it further? Yeah. It will probably only tell us how problematical it is, but sociologists of religion distinguish between two kinds of religious traditions. Some which they call communitarian, and many other words for that, and another which they call associational. A communitarian tradition is one in which the religion comes first. And the, sorry, the community comes first. I got it wrong. In which the community comes first, and the religion is an expression of the togetherness of the group. Now the best examples of this are the primary religions. And Hinduism is probably also belongs probably to this category, or ethnic religion, where the tradition, the community comes first, and the religion and expression of the togetherness. The associational religions are those in which beliefs and practices come first, and the religious community emerges out of its commitment to the beliefs and practices. Islam and Christianity are the primary examples here. Now, so for the, in the Indian case, therefore, to be born an in Hindu becomes a very strong marker, stronger marker of being an insider than in the other traditions. This is the point I was like. Now, the basic point of the distinction basically is that those who believe in that tradition claim to be the insiders. Those who accept the basic premises of that faith. They are the insiders. And those who don't are the outsiders. Now the question is complicated by the fact that people in the faith may not accept them. They will be treated as outsiders for the purpose of our discussion. Stage. I mean, we live in a globalized world, and we also live in a very complex world, and that's part of, you know, goes back also to the tensions that you're seeing in India today. It's who's an insider and who's an outsider. Um, but that means that we can have multiple identities. We can switch from being an insider to an outsider. <coughs> and uh, and you know, scholars of religion regularly do this when they're addressing their own community and when they're in an academic group. So uh, that there's certain dynamism has to be conceded in the distinction, absolutely. Yeah. Akhil, do you have a question? Just, uh, I think another way to look at it is uh, in the framework of believers and seekers, and faith and reason. So I could be an insider, I, I come from as a Hindu insider, but I'm a seeker of truth and challenge of so many beliefs that Hindus hold. So do you have any response to that? Yeah. Uh, if and the second sorry. thing I think what he was mentioning about right versus freedom, what is freedom from, and what he's talking about is freedom to. Right is the freedom to do something, and the freedom that we were talking about Expressions of freedom from. I think that's the distinction between the freedom from. Yeah, that's very helpful because that corresponds probably at first sight to the distinction between negative rights and positive rights. Mm -hmm. The question also stemmed from if you look at the Constitution of India, you're guaranteed certain freedoms. But as a part of the democratic uh, the, the principles, you have certain rights, but you're not guaranteed those rights by law. You are not? 
there are 10 democratic principles, uh, so the right to uh, practice religion freely, or the right to not be persecuted. These are rights that are not guaranteed by the law, but the freedom of expression, or the freedom of, uh, there are seven other freedoms, you're guaranteed by the rule of law. From I'm not sure system. about this. I think it's vacant to the fundamental rights and directive principles. Right. No, no, but there's a different distinction. There's a totally different distinction. The fundamental rights are justiciable, and the directive principles are not. That is a distinction. Both the examples you gave, uh, even freedom of religion is subject to Article what, 250, what A? I forget the third number, which has been notorious because it was invoked in the case recently of banning some books. You can't make statements which will provoke disharmony among religious groups. That curtails the freedom of religion, freedom of, sorry, freedom of expression. And maybe also for you. Now, to your point, uh, let me ask you a question. If you had a choice between Hinduism and truth, what would you choose as a Hindu? <laughs> See, I, don't accept that. I don't accept that question because at least what I learned through being a true Hindu is the only truth is what in your experience is true. Right? So I don't think that question is something that I find that I can answer to because. This is the ultimate. Yeah. At least the way I've learned it to be a true Hindu is, and that's the that's the reason I was asking the question between believer and seeker. That some of Hindus may think because I'm a seeker of truth, I'm challenging many beliefs, that I am actually an outsider. I become quote unquote Americanized. Yeah, okay. Now we have, there's a very interesting point here. Uh, seeker and believer. We'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> but on your question, or the question I tried to put to you. And I was not trying to put you in a spot. But the point there is that as a Hindu, one is obliged to choose truth. Choose? Truth. If the Hindu is offered a choice yeah. between truth and Hinduism, by the obligation of being a Hindu, he has to choose truth. So in your case, that conflict is not there. Yeah. The conflict comes when we have to distinguish between seeking truth and seeking certainty. Now, often people in a religion are not seeking truth all the time, but seeking certainty. And that is where the seekership becomes threatening. See, to, to that extent, we have this native native principle, right, which means everything is kind of uh, only partially true, and you can never find the true true, right? Only in supra-sensible matters, mm -hmm. only in matters of dharma and moksha, I can't find whether chair is there or not. Yeah. Empirical. That's, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm referring Only to that. Only in those that. matters. Yeah. We have two hands here, uh, Frederic and then Jesse. Frederic? Yes. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the, the overall context uh, of these often very acrimonious <laughs> debates is the fundamental uh, context of uh, the gays being overwhelmingly from the West onto the non-West, which is, of course, the historical result of colonialism, imperialism, and that continued globalization. And the reverse gaze is much, much smaller. So uh, that is a fundamental epistemological political context that colors the whole thing. And uh, I, for one, feel that very strongly that uh, given that, that truth, I think it's hard to contest that. Um, uh, certain certain things that have been written and said and done by colleague, Western colleagues of mine are totally crossing the line. Because I beg your pardon, totally crossing the line. They are not crossing acceptable the line. Yeah. Yeah. because that that embeddedness of the whole scholarly uh, endeavor in a much larger larger historical political context. It gets erased, right? gets forgotten, or 
or not seen very clearly. And that should be made much clearer always. That is fundamentally the context in which these, uh, these scholarly endeavors or non-scholarly <laughs> endeavors function. That is a point I did not address at all. But it's kind of the elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to raise the whole, keep the whole discussion at an academic level. Uh, but the but power it is an academic question. Yes, <laughs> but the politics, the, of the, the, politics of the The power imbalance is a very important role to play in it. But that again might, uh, is a very interesting uh, consequence because as, I mean, if we are right in our perception that the power balance is between the East, West and the rest is shifting mm. and probably gradually in favor of the rest, then the excesses on both sides might get toned down at it levels out. Yeah. Or it might in the short run become more bitter. Bit more in the big <laughs> as, as when a group, as in our politi political situation in the US right now, people who feel they're losing power become more angry and more furious because they're losing something. There may be a period of worse conditions. The immediate reaction may be more acrimonious than uh, usual or normal. Yeah. Long term might be better. Yeah. better. Yeah. Less fussy uh, Thanks very much, Professor. I, Speak I, loudly, please. Be sure. I just had a question about um, this relation, or what you think the academic community should do, or or should do. You mentioned the problem between the Hindu and the academic community maybe comes when the academic um, discussions or structures, psychological, <laughs> sociological their internal discussion filters uh, to the believers and they find some things they don't like. So this is where you find the problem comes. So then what, um, I'm wondering what is the, 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 how does that play out then? What should the academic do? It, it seems almost like you suggest the academic discussion should be cloistered or we should prevent those, um, those discussions in the academic context from exiting that context in order to, to prevent that disturbance amongst believers. Uh, I mean, should we be secret in our, in our discussions and only talk about sociology in our academic meetings together? Uh, a good question. Now, uh, the, there's the two sides to this. If you take the case of India and the West, and there are two sides to this, the Indian side and the Western side. The Indian side, the problem is, that we really have no concept of the academic study of religion in India so far. But I think the country is ready for it, right for it. Once the academic study of religion becomes a part of our curriculum, the situation has been aggravated by a view of secularism, which is very unsecular. Mm -hmm. That is, you should not teach religion at all. But this issue was resolved long ago in the USA. The secular universities can teach about religion. Yeah? Not of religion, but about religion. Uh, this, has, this, has not reached, this news has not reached India yet. And partly because of a knee-jerk reaction among secularists that this is letting in the genie by the back door because religion caused the division of India. And it gets very uh, emotional at that point. The whole argument. Uh, but that's, I think, is a short sighted view. So, once we have a tradition of the academic study of religion in India, we would realize that there are certain freedoms which the academics enjoy, both Indian and Western. On the Western side, I think it would be wise just to be uh, the phrasing is very important, uh, in which the, the way the point is phrased. So, in a sense, we might say, Upaya Kaushalya, as it means, uh, which Buddhists have long advocated, could be used by uh, others also. The points can be made and they will also be discussed. I mean, people are not that averse to criticism. After all, Hinduism has a long tradition of internal critique. The Mimansa and the Vedanta and all the schools, this goes on all the time and can become quite vicious at places. Then Hinduism has been used to the critique of Jains and Buddhists and materialists, and then Islam and Christianity, and now secularism and science. 
when people feel that they are being denigrated yeah, a little in the guise of objectivity, the question is why is the objectivity always directed against us? <laughs> <laughs> Hands in the back there? Yes, please. Uh, yes, yourself. Yes. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I, got, uh, I was looking at the seven sets of issues you mentioned, and the first one, the response threshold, seems to be a key one. Uh, I'm not an academic, I'm a believer. So uh, I like the fact that a uh, believer, you know, if can get the opportunity to advance his or her ideas. Because I think this is not just an issue for Hinduism. I think this is an issue for religion in general now in the world, uh, especially Islam, uh, uh, Christianity as well. So what can we do uh, to advance these uh, opportunities where the, pra the, the, the person who practices gets to, to uh, express his or her ideas more openly with the academic? Um, and uh, there are more forums like this where we can exchange this, not just for Hinduism, but for any other religion. Do you have any suggestions on a global level? Not uh, offhand. I mean, uh, the, uh, the obvious thing is that one should speak up. There's a very interesting statement by Elie Wiesel that it may not be always in our power to prevent uh, injustice, mm -hmm. but it is always in our power to protest it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not now. No, no, I'm not trying to uh, retreat into loftiness uh, <laughs> by quoting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What I'm saying is basically, people should advance their view. Right. Yeah. Because, like I said, this is not just an issue. I think this is for religion in general, especially religions yeah. like Islam and also. Christianity were facing this, so... Uh, uh, I mean, one possible way of, to deal with this would be that just as the academics have their own organizations, mm -hmm. the believers should have their own organizations which address these traditions at an intellectual level. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And then these two bodies can yeah. engage in conversation. Because if we have the academics just doing their own thing, they're very much out of touch. Something they have to realize this. Yeah. They have to realize this. I don't think they are naturally perverse. <laughs> <laughs> if I could add to that, just a thought that um, I think the changing nature of how the academic thinks of the academic own person mm -hmm. may make it more possible to be more autobiographical or more open. Because you know, most academics have real lives off campus. They often leave it at the door and don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And often people are intensely involved in what they study but don't think it's proper to bring it in. If, if the academics are more confessional, in a sense, about why they do what they do, at least some, then there may be a level of, sure, you know, we, we all live on the same earth. We all have our feet on the ground. I do this, I, you do that, and we can talk to each other. But you need, as you say, situations like this, not just for Hindu, but also for Islam and Judaism and so on. I think Shekhar is wanting to ask a question. Yes, yeah. that's why he's yeah. next. Yeah. Professor Sharma, um, your sixth point, you mentioned uh, academic versus polemical. Um, I have a... The uh, book, academic versus polemical book. Yeah. <laughs> I would uh, uh, suggest a, uh, another thing, um, another term, intention, as to what is the intention of the scholar or whoever is uh, articulating something. And uh, academic, polemical, or there could be a range of uh, manifestation of such uh, 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 articulation. Well, Shikha, it's a good point, but my fear is, uh, my uh, reservation is, that once we bring in motives, the whole thing degenerates into muslim or has a tendency to but here is a you know i i actually just the primary question also is that you know how do you construe a summon being academic because it could be that the real scholar is uh, the scholarship can actually just only come from uh, um, uh, uh, 
the believer or the inside the, uh, the tradition. And uh, uh, the intention of the academic is of uh, more polemic or, or, or some other intention for that. So I mean, that's where I'm coming from, actually. So just, you know, just even defining who is an academic, yes. someone at a university, Okay, there are three, three points here, yeah. uh, three levels. One is the intention of the academic first in the study of religion, as I understand it, is to understand a tradition as the believers believe it. First, first intention. Uh, and I have not had this, being, this position being, ser heard, being seriously challenged. One has to know the tradition as the believers know it. First intention. The second level of intention is what is the truth, especially regarding historical events. Did a certain historical event take place at the time the tradition believes it to have taken place? The way it is supposed to have taken place? The, so truth becomes another level of intention. One, you might say, the desire, the intention to know what the beliefs and practices are then the desire, the desire, intention to know the truth about the history, about these beliefs and practices and how they arose and so on. Now, the idea that the intention of the academic may be suspect is a new development, is a relatively new development in our field. The field of the study of religion has undergone, according to one grand summation, and I am told that Precision is always the price for better, okay? <laughs> so the three phases are the first stage when you had material. The study of religion was collecting material about all religions as far as possible. Second method, how do we study these, this material? How do we analyze this material? And the third is motive. Now, especially after science, with what, what motive are we approaching this? With our, our motive behind our method and our use of the material. So in a sense, what you are saying fits into this particular view of the evolution of our field. But I, I don't know that we have evolved man, man methods of dealing with this, uh, dealing with motive in an academic way. Yeah. In situations of where there's a lack of trust and a lack of respect yes, altogether, yeah, yeah. you're not ready for that. Yeah. Yeah. So you have laid bare the problem. Yeah. Uh, you've been waiting, and then. Yeah. Uh, so my question related to the use of religion in the political space. Now, uh, Mahatma Gandhi also used religious symbolism in the political space, but in the main objective. Uh, that his symbolism did not, was not threatening to the other and was not abrasive to the sensibilities of other. Today what we see in the context of Hinduism, the context of other religions also, that the use of uh, religion in the political space is becoming very incendiary and uh, uh, leads to a great amount of intolerance and friction and violence. And when we get that scenario, then when you say that we are ready for academic scholarship about religion, let's say in the attack of Trump, uh, the space for freedom of thought is being shrunk so much that if you say anything that violates or goes against the perception of some people who happen to hold or in the power, then they, they, they just want to completely uh, eliminate uh, that space of the freedom of, of thinking in, in religious terms. And so what is your perspective uh, in this regard? So my perspective is that if we do not have correct information, okay, let me backtrack a bit. The current climate of opinion in India is that you should not teach religion at all in the curriculum. Leave it to the 
confessional groups to teach it. Because study of religion will be divisive. This is the current opinion. I think this is very short-sighted because when we think of a religion, any, we take the name of any religion, certain ideas come to our mind. If these ideas are not based on information, they will be based on prejudice. So it is not as if by not talking about religion, we are helping the cause of religious peace. We are in fact betraying it because when you don't speak out of knowledge, then you speak out of prejudice or ignorance. And the best way of overcoming this is to introduce the study of religion in the Indian academia, which has been suggested by a committee headed by the Professor Radha Krishna as early as 1948, to whose life and work you alluded to. And there have been a series of commissions which have been recommending this. And even the Supreme, a case, the Supreme Court decided in favor of yeah. allowing for uh, the study of religion. But the governments have been very reluctant to take it up. Now the interesting thing is, and here I am going to become a bit autobiographical, and I hope autobiographical without being self-indulgent, the two main people in the BJP I've spoken to on this point, Adwani, Mr. Adwani and Mr. Modi, I found them totally open to this idea. In fact, one of them asked me to produce a document so that they could set things in motion for such a center being created around the university. So it is this, this so-called Hindu nationalist extremist party which is open to this idea. And the secularist, so-called secularist parties won't entertain it at all, which is a bit baffling. I mean, for me. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> okay. I think this is a question about something, but what you just said is very interesting too. I just wanted to ask a clarification about what you feel is the project of uh, religious studies when you said just now, I think, in answering someone else's question, that you are to sort of accurately describe and understand what the believers believe. Now, and, uh, and uh, you, you also said earlier, Catwell Smith, you should not say that which the believer will not accept, right? Well now, what, what happens when you have a kind of psychoanalysis and religion context where uh, you are actually analyzing, let's say, the, uh, the lingam as phallus or Ganesha trunk as phallus and so on. You are, let's say you have the best intentions, you want to actually get it right. And you are putting across this view that you actually think this is what is going on. Um, but these are not the kind of things that, as you said, a survey of beliefs are going to tell you. Most likely not, because that language itself may not be the language of the ordinary Hindu. That this is a phallic symbol, you'd have to explain it first and you know, maybe get a training in psychoanalysis to be able to see it. So, but you write this account, and it's highly disturbing to some section, let's say. So you're saying something which people are not necessarily wanting to accept, but then it comes to this truth issue. You believe it's true, uh, but it's perhaps at the level of unconscious belief. Then what do you think in that context the religious studies scholar is supposed to do? Should one defend and hold to that view? It doesn't matter if it's in the West or if it's, let's say, in an Indian university religious studies department, but where psychoanalysis and religion is studied. So, should one? So, what is the what what you what is the right position then for the religious studies scholar who is saying things that he or she thinks is true but are not easily verifiable at, at the level of belief? Yes, so I have to answer this at. Uh two levels. The first is that what really upsets people when they, deal, when they are dealing with such descriptions, believers dealing with such descriptions, is not often so much, at least in the, in the memory of the Indic religious traditions, which I am more familiar, and I've, I've under, maybe under the illusion that I have a better sense of. 
is the exclusive predication. If you say that a symbol is capable of multiple interpretations, this is what I think is the most cogent. Instead of saying, this is what it is. That is why I said how it is phrased. So you, when you, you allow for the fact that your analysis is what we call a reductive analysis, and the other party also knows that it is being recognized as such, then the tensions are not that great. It is when interpretation is confused with fact. Right? The Hindus worship Shivling as a phallus. There will be maximum opposition. Hindus worship Shivanga, which some have suggested is phallic in nature, much less opposition. If you suggest that in the second century, Guri Mallam representation is so anatomically obvious that it has to be accepted as phallic, then you might say that maybe it was phallic at one time in nature, but over history. For Hinduism has a tendency of taking any belief and practice and refining it. Okay? So you can argue that it has been made into a rounded and conical, it has been given a conical shape to indicate the formlessness of Shiva. So you have come all the way from it being phallic to the other end. If these arguments are made in such a context, then I don't think they will be considered violative of one's feelings that very grievously. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the committed share might still feel offended, but not to the extent of, you know, becoming violent or protest you know, vehemently. So that was the first part. The second is, because we are dealing with, area, are dealing with the second level is that because we are dealing with things which offend the insider or which can be potentially offensive to the insider, but potentially useful in the study of religion, in psychology, psychology, sociology of religion, this is one of those points which will have to be constantly negotiated. So this idea that there are some issues which have been constantly negotiated, I think, needs to be accepted more wholeheartedly. This whole issue of conversion and non-conversion. Because both the aspects, both the sides, can claim to have truth on their side. In this case, the academic might say, I'm looking for truth. I'm a psychoanalyst. This is the truth. And the believer will say, I'm a believer. I have worshipped Shiva all my life. This is the truth. You can never reverse all these. You have to negotiate between these. Same thing about conversion. Suppose I, sitting here, suddenly have an insight which answers all the cosmic issues. Yeah. <coughs> you think I can keep it to myself? <laughs> and not tell, tell Frank? <laughs> I've got it. <laughs> At the same time, Frank is within his eyes to say, Well, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, I am not interested in uh, hearing this. <laughs> Both your right you know, to accept your have our own beliefs and practices as inviolable, or as natural right, I would say, as my right that I have solved humanity's problems, I have to share it. And there, here the point about power imbalances made by Friedrich becomes very relevant. Because the line of negotiation is affected deeply by the power balance or imbalance. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little on the distinction between an academic book and a polemical book. And I can imagine a work having both of those things going on at the same time. And um, what kind of uh, line would you draw to determine where it lies on the gradation? I think I tried to address that in passing, I am afraid, when I said whether a book claims to be an academic book 
Oh, yes. And whether it deals with academic matters, but sets out to be polemical rather than academic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A book which claims to be academic all the way, and one which is being polemical about academic. But, well, my question involves like a, 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 a strict distinction between what one is and what the other is. And can both be going on at the same time in the same work? Uh, Do you know what I mean? Yes, yes, it is possible. But I think uh, the, the difference would be uh, you may not be able to implement the distinction yeah, in, actual, in the field. But the distinction would be that the dialogue between academics is about truth value, whereas between others is my trying to convince the other person of my position. So the academic is open to being modified by dialogue, and the polemical is not. Time maybe for one or two more questions from people who haven't asked questions yet. In the last 20 minutes, uh, three core values have been touched on very, very briefly. Trust, respect, and peace. I'm wondering if uh, the academic milieu has created a hierarchy of values that has put truth at the top and devalued these others of respect, truth, and peace. And that might be a long-term problem. Um, would you have a response to how to sort out how we work with those values in the academy? But you see, but truth can disturb people. And well, I guess what I'm saying, maybe truth should be sacrificed at times for the sake of peace. Uh, well, the Hindu tradition certainly says, for the sake of saving a life, truth can be sacrificed for saving a life. Uh, for the sake of peace, probably. <laughs> yes. But for the sake of truth, now truth for the sake of salvation, <coughs> or when you are dealing with matters of ultimate value, concern, then it's slightly different. Then the compass shifts. Um, for instance, in Hinduism, you are, in Manu, you are clearly alive, allowed to tell a lie to save the life of a Shudra, a Vaishya, a Kshatriya, or a Brahma. But you see, the Hinduism also has another way of dealing with this, that sometimes you have to sacrifice the truth, but you have to atone for it. Say that again. You have to atone for sacrificing the truth. So, uh, for instance, at one stage in Hindu legal history, the body of the female was considered inviolable. That is, she could never be killed. But she could be sentenced to death for treachery, treason. But for doing that, the king had to fast for three days and undo a ritual for having caused the death of a woman. Thank you. Anyone up for a last question? Someone who hasn't brought one up yet? If not, then we should. I think we've learned that Professor Sharma is a wonderful, clear lecturer and also a wonderful question taker, answerer, obviously a very good teacher too. So modeling all the things that Dr. Radhakrishnan would have liked to have seen. Yeah. Thank you very much.